Ladies and gentlemen, there's no better way to get up in the morning than to get up with Garrett. Garrett is a third generation success credentialed real estate entrepreneur here to give you tips, tricks, and share stories of success. Ladies and gentlemen, Garrett Bedroom. Good morning, Dougie, Good morning. and take your time with those little wonderful tongue tied tongue tied tongue-tied. there. And yes. You know, make sure you go, wake up nice and early and yes. have your coffee. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Good to see you. So last time I saw you, I think we were here. Juliet was with us. We yeah. had uh, Take Your Daughter to Work Day. Family affair. And we had a lot of fun. It's a family biz. That's yeah. how I grew up, right? Going to work with my dad and seeing that. And we had a fun time. Took Juliet over to Hedges and to the uh, salons by JC here in Wyckoff mm -hmm. and, of course, to the family office and uh, got to have a lot of good fun. And she enjoyed herself. And I actually saw her teacher at softball couple days ago and I said, Hey, I appreciate that you gave her the ability to to do that. She really learned a lot and had fun and 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 nice. you know he agreed and said don't let it happen again. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's a beautiful um Thursday morning. I, th I think we're past kind of this the cold old winter spring now and, and we're into that real what we'd expect warm weather in, in the 70s and it's great. I woke up and the the Warriors had a big victory. Yeah. Stayed up late last night and uh, they're playing every other night now. Warriors Versus Lakers, uh, pretty much on, on TNT. If you're mm -hmm. if you're watching, and our our guest today, wh who we're going to get to in, in a few minutes, uh, Joshua Kagan actually is a big Laker fan, and just reminded me uh -oh. that he grew up and went to high school uh, with with Baron Davis, who had an incredible run mm -hmm. with the Warriors. So kind of a small uh, small world there, right? Yeah. And you guys going to fight on the show today? We may. We may okay. throw it down. We, we probably had a few of those through the years. A couple of fisticas. But the Warriors are uh, now it's 3-2. They were down 3-1, and everyone was getting a little nervous. Um, but, you know, they do have home court. So, you know, they need to win one game in L.A., uh, which would be tomorrow night, game six. And then they come back for game seven, which last series they won game seven in Sacramento. Mm -hmm. So you would think game seven they'd have the advantage in San Francisco. And plus, they're running at such a pace that is like sea biscuit pace i call it yeah. uh it's just incredible and I, I don't think the lakers with lebron uh will be able to keep up and um you know and, and keep hitting their big shots if they have to go to game seven in san francisco and we'll find out about anthony davis he had uh, kind of an elbow to the head uh and hopefully he didn't get a concussion and you know you, nowadays you really got to be really careful with with these players uh maybe missing a game or two uh, if there's a major head injury, like, you know, Tua had that problem. Uh, it didn't look like a major hit. No, I don't think so. I don't, I'm, I'm hopeful. I, I Look, if we're going to win, I want to win the right way. Yeah. I, I don't want someone to say, well, their best player was out. Yeah. Because there's a huge difference with Anthony Davis in, mm -hmm. the, in the lineup down there. I mean, he is somewhat un unguardable. Mm -hmm. Although Looney's feeling better. Uh, Looney uh, is the center. He did not play uh, many minutes in the first few games. And there's a huge difference to last night. I think he played 20 minutes and had... Uh, almost as many uh, rebounds as Anthony Davis and uh, not as many points, of course. So that's a big difference. Uh, the Knicks also survived last night. They were down 3-1 on the verge of elimination against the Miami Heat, uh, mm -hmm. who continue through the past 30 years just to have a fantastic franchise. You know, Pat Riley and Eric Spolstra just done a fantastic job down there. And uh, But they lost the game, and, and the Knicks are alive. And now that game will go back to Miami, um, and, we'll, and we'll see what happens. And um, so that's been interesting. And then, of course, football, you know, if you're a New York fan, uh, you're a little down because the Rangers are out. The Devils uh, are not not ahead. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the Yankees and the Mets have kind of been stinking it up a little bit. But if you're a New York fan, you're probably excited about the schedule release for the NFL. And I think most of it's dropping today, but they hinted a few games mm -hmm. over the past couple of days. So, Dougie, what are you doing Christmas Day? So probably getting in a fight with my wife because I'm going to want to go to the Giant Eagle game. <laughs> there, you go. there you go. I mean, look, I, I'm not so familiar with Christmas being being Jewish. But from my, mm -hmm. what I understand, my friends who celebrate Christmas, they're pretty much done pretty quickly. Maybe eight, nine in the morning. Right. Kids get up early, open the gifts. Yeah. But then you're going to like a relative's house for dinner. Like it's like, you know, maybe you're working a nap. Plus, like a giant game. You're pre game and you're in the parking lot, you know, tailgating at 9 a.m. So, so like, what I'm yeah. thinking is you have to have one of your buddies call you. Right. And be like, listen, I got a problem. I got a water break here in the house. <laughs> Come on over with a shop back. Yeah. You say to your wife, look, I got to go rescue this guy. And, and then you enjoy the game. But um, so Christmas we Day, it's Giants. It's at Eagles, though. Oh, then they, yeah, I can't you're not going. It. I'm not pulling that off. Nah, if it was a luck. Giants, different story, but also it's Samantha's first Christmas. Oh, you know, so. baby's first Christmas. Yeah. yeah, forget it. Hey, it's baby's first Hanukkah too. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. 
Friedman with an E. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so that's exciting to see the Giants um, have some conversations. You know, we'll find out more today. I was hopeful that there was going to be a giant jet game. Uh, well, there is going to be a giant jet game. Yeah. That, that's accurate. The question is, is will they do it on, on 9-11, which Ooh. is September 11th would, would be um, yeah. a game that the date, you know, that, that could happen. That would be crazy. So I thought that would be great for New York. We'll find out about that. Um, I think that would just be epic for, yeah. you know, honoring everyone. Um, the Jets start with the Bills. Jets Monday are the Night Bills. Monday Night Football first week. And there's a lot of international games, too. Interesting. Right? There's They're going back to Germany. I yeah. think the Jaguars have, like, the Jaguars partially live in London. I think they have back-to-back -back mm -hmm. games I read. And um, so it's going to be interesting to see. And uh, how about Jets Packers? Is that a game maybe next year? Yeah. No, I don't year? know. I don't know. I don't know. Did you imagine going back to Lambo? I don't know if they play, but I mean, it's going to be very interesting. <laughs> they might be able to steal their first game from the Bills. You know, I'd rather yeah. play the Bills early than play them when they're like, you know, oh, yeah. warmed Hot. up. Yeah. 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 Play them early, maybe steal it from them. Aaron Rodgers. So listen, as a reminder to everyone watching, we are live on the Get Up With Garrett show. We have an email address. You can email the show, getupwithgarrett at gmail.com. We also can chat with you live. So if you have comments, you know, maybe you're interested in letting us know what game you're most looking forward to. I can't wait to hear about the Giants versus the Raiders in Vegas. <laughs> that's one I need to tell my wife. That's my friend in Vegas had yeah. a pipe burst. Yeah, and I got to film you. Thank you. <laughs> and so I got to come with the camera. You're going to come yeah, and, and pretend I'm scenes. a celebrity. Yeah, who you them. are. So, so anybody, we got to uh, we got to film this whole this whole project. Any friends that are up in Vegas watching, we we're looking forward to seeing you. Doug and I will be out there for Giants <laughs> Vegas. I, I know I've got like three group of friends that have already said I really want to go to Vegas, yeah. but but no one knows the date, no one knows the cost. Yeah. So I'm hoping one of those friend groups comes yeah. comes through. Um and uh so so that's exciting. So we'll get more information on that. And a couple other things. I sent you the the link to the Jewish home mm -hmm. uh golf event for those of you that are interested in some of the charities that the family supports. We love the Jewish home uh, in, in Rockley, Jewish home family. And this is our annual big golf event, but it has changed. Now it's also golf, tennis, yoga, and everyone's favorite pickleball, which is the hottest growing or fastest growing sport. Not sure who backs that up, but uh, that's what everyone's talking about. So if you are interested and you live in northern New Jersey, uh, reach out to us. We'll send you the link to register. You can do golf. You can do tennis. You can do a tennis clinic. You can do pickleball. Or you can just come for brunch or dinner, and there's a, there's a silent auction. I heard there's some Giants tickets in the front row up for auction. Uh, I heard there may be a Steph Curry jersey uh, up for auction. Um, so those are some things that are fabulous. So Garrett's just giving stuff away, huh? No, no. <laughs> and, You're giving all your stuff away? <laughs> I'm starting to retire that the sounds collection. Like, yeah, that sounds like some Garrett stuff. And, uh, you know, we appreciate your support. Or you can just make a $100 donation or buy a, a you know, raffle ticket, whatever, and uh, – I believe Love Letters will be there too. Uh -huh. And Love Letters has been working hard for Hedges, working uh -huh. on some uh, some resident gifts, some wine wine totes. So shout out to uh, Love Letters for their support of, yes. of Hedges. So speaking of Hedges, the yeah. family's 13-year uh, uh, mixed-use project, which uh -huh. uh, has been under construction for the last two years, we are like just about the finish line. So nice. we started leasing. Awesome. All right. Um and I don't know if you want to bring up the Instagram account. I can kind of show you a couple pictures uh, from from uh, the I mean, model. I got the leasing. pictures you gave me. Or what did I give you? Yeah, yeah. That's, I forgot so that's what a little I gave easier. <laughs> that's a little easier. That's a little easier. We got this one right here, the beautiful wall. Oh, look at that. That Looks is like our, a seat. our well, the bench is uh, on back order. Yep, that's coming this week. That's a built in wall. So when you nice. walk in, you're going to know right away you're in a property that screams health and wellness and natural light and feeling good about yourself and of course greenery and hedges mm -hmm. and positive attitude. So awesome. that's installed. We got that going. What else did I send you? Um, uh, did I send you got... the storage boxes? Yeah. Oh yeah. We've got the Luxor package system here. So basically if you're anything like my wife, you get a million Amazon packages, uh -huh. right? And they come in all different sizes, mm -hmm. thin little envelopes, big mm -hmm. boxes. So we bought this system where uh, your packages will now be safe and secure. So you will get a text message on your mm -hmm. phone when you get a package and it'll be in a certain slot or you also have dry cleaning, right? You see the ones in the middle, those are kind of mm -hmm. a little bigger for dry cleaning. Uh, and then you've got your refrigerator. So if you get grocery deliveries from Whole Foods, Stop and Shop, Wegmans, wherever it may be, or medicine delivered from mm -hmm. Walgreens or whatever, it can go into that fridge nice. safely and you come back from work and you'll, you'll pick it up there. Uh, that's awesome. And that's the Luxor package system. We also have an overflow package room 
during the holidays because you're going to get yeah. extra boxes uh, or large, you know, golf clubs, whatever mm -hmm. would, would come. So anyone yeah. interested, please go to um, hedges at Hawthorne dot com mm -hmm. and you can set up your VIP tour. We are doing tours of phase one. Mm -hmm. Phase two is still um, in, in certain kind of construction. It's not really under construction, but it's more like punch list stuff. Mm -hmm. So a little dustier, dirtier. So we're just doing the, the phase one right now. And we have studios. Uh, we have one bedrooms. We have two bedrooms. And today, uh, or yesterday, I should say, we passed our elevator inspections, which was a huge issue. So you don't have to take the stairs anymore. We were allowed to go in the elevators. Mm -hmm. And... Um, you know, we think people are going to start moving in the first uh, the first week of June. We're going to write the leases for for June first. Nice. So let us know. Happy to to help. I mentioned. Do you want to? Do you want to? Yeah. Do you want to give them a little VIP access to you? If they wanted the edge to, to email to get up with Garrett at yeah, Gmail account. Absolutely. If you email us, a uh, VIP we will treatment? VIP you to the <laughs> top of the list. Wow. Absolutely. Nice. Absolutely. And the other big news with hedges is um you know this project is not just luxury apartments it's self-storage with cube smart so mm -hmm. we've been renting the cubes right mm -hmm. they're always doing different promos um but we also have retail so planet fitness is open they're doing really really well and we just signed up a new tenant at hedges nice and i want to debut and 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 kind of drop that right here live, live on the get up with garrett show oh my god so thank you for tuning in this morning you are going to be the first to know we have a wonderful new cafe coming called Per Lee Cafe. Uh, Dougie will bring up some of the images. Per Lee Cafe, there it is. Specialty coffee, gelatos, salads, juices, paninis, grab and go foods. So if you're working out at Planet Fitness, you want to get a smoothie afterwards, walk next door. You want to grab a sandwich to go to the train to New York, just go next door. And, uh, you know, specialty coffee, iced coffees, special cappuccinos. And you got to see, they're, they're just so innovative. They've got a, a gelato, um, not a truck, what are they building? Uh, a cart, like a gelato cart mm -hmm. that they want to build and use for promotion with the town and promotion in, in hedges. Um, so we're real thrilled. They are occupying the space on the end. Mm -hmm. It's 1,200 square feet, and they're expected to open in uh, July, July or is August. This the, is this the picture of that space? No, that's the no, leasing office. My no, bad. but my that's bad. fine. That's that's where you park when you're all coming right, on your right. VIP okay. tour. <laughs> you know, and thanks to Adam at Speed Pro, he did a great job with that signage. It definitely looks great. Um, no, it's it's in the Planet Fitness building. I didn't send you a new picture, okay. but it's in the Planet Fitness building, and uh, we're just real thrilled. This was exactly what I wanted. Let nice. me be clear. Well, this is what I told the brokers: go find me this. And shout out to Ripco, uh, the the brokerage team at Ripco. Uh, Corey and Stein, who is new to, to the company, did a great job canvassing and cold calling and Matt Grundy and, of course, Curtis Nassau, who have been great friends of the family and do a fabulous job for uh, the bedrooms and, and for our, our assets. So and they also work on our salons by JC stuff, nice, which is cool. So what are you excited about trying at Pearly Cafe? What, what do you think you're uh, going to go I mean, there? De definitely. Uh, I tried giving up coffee. Didn't work out, as you could tell. I'm yeah. back on the grind. And uh, yeah, some coffee, some paninis. You know, it's got a little bit of a, you know, no matter what time of day, you got something that'll for sure you know, make the, the the taste buds dance. Absolutely. <laughs> and maybe I'll, I'll get rid of this Duncan cup and yeah. start sponsoring the Pearly Cafe cup. Um, now we have one more space left for retail, 1200 square feet. Nice. Uh, what do you think would be a good fit there with, you know, yeah, keep in mind, workout stuff. And we have the planet fitness next door. So we're done there. with that. You got the cafe. I don't know. Maybe, maybe like a sushi. Sushi, yeah, maybe uh, sushi. Listen, last week, you know what I mean. That's I don't something know what... like that's like because like you can like have a nice little dinner, but you can also grab and go it. Yeah, it is grab and go. How long is sushi good for though? Like if you grab and go it and you're on the train for 45 minutes, do you I need an ice pack? Or are you okay? No, I last a day. I yeah. I definitely buy sushi at lunchtime and eat it at like you know 10 o'clock at, at night. Been sitting in my car. Okay, I'm I'm alive. You're fine. <laughs> <laughs> Be like Doug, everybody. Yeah, I'm alive. Yeah, I ate it. I was thinking maybe something like stretching. You know, we had to stretch Jake from from Stretch Recovery mm -hmm. Lounge um, or physical therapy. I thought would be great. Something in the health and wellness space. Yeah. Um, again, it's not a large space, twelve hundred feet. Mm -hmm. So, and you don't want to do much more food. That's kind of what I wanted. That look quick little takeout mm -hmm. coffee. Yeah. So, but stay in touch. You know, we'll uh, we'll be updating you here on Get Up with Garrett with the different things that we launch mm -hmm. and uh, maybe uh, since the cafe is more of a morning thing. Maybe something an evening thing. I don't now. Like I'm not trying to say like a bar, a bar, but 
What a I mean, great you idea. probably need you probably need like liquor yeah, license. Yeah, that's a whole another world. Another, yeah, yeah, it could be a brewery. You don't need a liquor license for a brewery. Really? But it could be like a the, the cafe is a more of a morning thing. Probably closes at like you know five or yeah. like, who knows. When I'm not sure close. yet. Right. But it could be like when people come back from work, something that they would like to. That's cool. To enjoy. Sit down. Little wine bar or okay, brewer, really cool. brewery like oh. Hawthorne Brewing Company or something. Brewer mm-hmm. own Hedges maybe wine like maybe Hedges. like a little Italian spot and you bring your wine there. All right, bring your BYOB. I, like. I love the entrepreneurship. Oh, I love yeah. I love the uh, the vision. Okay, little, how about a kombucha bar? I know you love that yeah, stuff, yeah. right? That's good for you. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so look, I think that's that's enough of banter on that. And uh, <laughs> we are really fortunate that we got a great guest today. It's pretty rare that we have a an old friend of the show, an old friend of the family. Come on. Um, I want to introduce everyone to Joshua Kagan uh, from Bonfire Homes. And Joshua and I have been friends for, uh, I would guess, 30 years. Wow. Nice. <laughs> know each other 30 years. Met uh, in, in, I guess, the early 90s in summer camp in, in Maine. And, um, you know, I, I think he's got a lot to offer. He's going to talk a little bit about uh, the future of real estate and kind of his path and being an entrepreneur and real estate investing. And we'll open us up and educate us to some great things. So, Joshua, I know you've been enjoying the green M and M's in the uh, in the green room. So, why don't you come on and join the join the show? There, there he is. Awesome, Garrett. Great nice to reconnect, you. man. Great, to, great to see you. And uh, thanks for having me today. And thanks for getting up with Garrett. I know you know Joshua's on the West Coast, mm-hmm. and so he's up early every day and 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 doing his thing. So, um, Joshua, let's just get started with kind of your your career path a little bit in terms of real estate. I know your family definitely invested in real estate, always been around real estate growing up. Did you feel the need to to want to do something and join your family? Did you kind of want to do your your own thing and, and kind of go on your own and talk a little bit about about what that was like? Yeah, no, it's 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 a great question. Um so like many sort of rebellious, you know, young people, I wanted to do the opposite of whatever my family was doing. Um, my dad had um, a life insurance business. He started at 21 that he you know, wanted me to take over. And then my mom and stepdad had, had the real estate business. And I just, I went off on my own. I went to graduate school in London. I went into the media business. I worked at Sony BMG um, in the new media division for a number of years in London, came back to the States, started my own organic apparel and accessories company, got clobbered by the 2008 recession. And some of our board of advisors owned a clean tech venture capital firm in San Francisco, called him up and asked for a job. And he said, yes, I went to work at Atlas Capital. Um, And then in 2010-ish, Richard Branson and Al Gore had dinner. Branson got really freaked out about climate change, wanted to do something entrepreneurial about it, created this company called The Carbon War Room and asked my boss to be the founding COO of it. And he asked me to come over and run the energy efficiency and buildings division. And we are focused on just basically investing in energy efficiency projects and multifamily office, et cetera. Did that for four years. We ended up getting acquired. I went to a startup called Clean Fund that was providing a form of financing called PACE, if you've heard of that before, property Mm -hmm. assessment energy. And that's kind of how I cut my teeth in the sort of prop tech, fintech world. Now, in 2011, I bought my first foreclosure. And it was in the Berkeley Hills and it was extremely lucky, the timing. And I, I rolled up my sleeves and was the GC on it and, you know, replaced the floors, wow. the bathrooms. How did, how did you find out about now? This is Berkeley in, yeah. in California near the Bay Area, right? Yes. I was living in San Francisco. Oh, you're living in San Francisco. Okay. So how did you hear about this opportunity? So I knew that I wanted to, uh, to buy something um, and I just kind of coming off to the crash in 2008, nine, it just seemed like a good, good time to buy. And, um, I, my, a friend of mine, a mentor of mine introduced me to his broker, his real estate agent, who's like focuses on distressed properties. And it was, it was kind of a complicated transaction, Jared, Garrett. It was like, uh, we bought this, it was the house itself was a short sale and, and the bank had foreclosed the land next door. And my agent was like, I know it's called a short sale. It's going to take forever. But if you have patience, (laughs) you're going to get a great deal. And it was like for six months, we didn't hear anything. And then four o'clock on December 31st, we we found out it was like, you know, the banks were just clearing out what was on on their their inventory. And I had to learn the process of, you know, fixing up a house, renting it, being a property manager. And then I started doing more foreclosures, then started doing fix and flips then started doing the Burr method of, you know, buy, rehab, rent, refinance. Right. We've heard that. A lot of people have mentioned the Burr method. I think even Matt um, from, from our last episode, well, I can never get his last, 
<laughs> Pacheni um, has talked about that because I know he's done some deals with some of the guys from you know bigger pockets. I don't think they necessarily invented it. They just maybe talked about it most. With you know you you buy something, you rehab it, you renovate it, you refinance it. Um, and the reason why people love doing that is because, and I've mentioned this, Doug, many times to you, but mm -hmm. um, refinance proceeds, right? Which means taking on more debt basically is tax free. So if you have a house that you buy for $100,000 and you put in $100,000, uh, but let's say now it's worth 300, right? Um, so now that you go to the bank and, and they say, okay, we'll give you 250. The money that they give you, obviously you have to pay interest on it, right? It's, it's, it's a mortgage, mm -hmm. but it's tax free, right? So you don't, you mm -hmm. don't, you don't pay any, you don't pay uncle Sam. This is all legal. You don't pay uncle Sam any money uh, versus selling it, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe you make a little more money, but mm -hmm. you're paying taxes. So kind of people love this method really helps them build wealth and uh, kind of keeps building that passive cash flow engine. Then you go to the next one, right? And mm -hmm. next thing you know, you wake up and you have 10 and that's, you know, full-time nice. uh, side hustle. So, so you, so you love the Burr method. You're a big fan of that. It sounds like from the, or, or, or at least that you were at that point. <laughs> I am now. I mean, I've done, I, I, moved yeah. to Denver, I moved to Denver a couple of years ago and I've done like five of these since I've, since gotcha. I've been that made a lot more sense when interest rates we're three percent, yes. and I'm yes. buying and fixing things that could be a seven percent yield on day one, right? I'm just capturing sure. the margin between the two. Burr methods on hold a little bit if uh, if, if interest rates are seven or eight percent going in, right? It's very tough. Very tough. Very, very tough. tough. Also in, in what, what other what other um what other challenges during the heyday when you were doing the Burr method? Can you can you share some some challenges that you learned or something that was like a big wake up call that would be helpful for maybe somebody watching who when interest rates do come back down, can get yeah. back into to Burr? Well, I tried to do the Burr method in the Bay and that was just next to impossible. And, and the reason why that was, was you're competing against people who are looking for their starter homes, who have a lot of money, who can make emotional purchases. Um, okay. So they don't, they're not looking at cap rates or, you know, return right. on you know, yield investment, cost, right, right. Uh, yeah, all that stuff, right? So that it's really hard to do that in, I think top tier markets where people are are just spending a million dollars for a starter home. For a know? starter house. Yeah, you're right. You're right. We, we hear a lot about these Burr methods, but the truth is a lot of these homes are located in markets where the income level is not a young couple making two, 300 grand or spending a million dollars. Maybe it's in, you know, Kansas city or, or in Oklahoma city or somewhere in Texas. And, you know, the average one bedroom apartment costs only $800 or, uh, the starter house is three hundred thousand dollars. They're not necessarily going on a million dollars. So, I, I could see what you mean. Someone who has a good income, you know, they may they may buy this million dollar house, but that doesn't mean you're going to be able to rent it at a respectable right. return that would be commensurate with the risk, right, of, of being a real estate investor. So exactly. That's, that's, so moving yeah. moving from the Bay no. where we, we were looking at you know nine hundred to a thousand dollars a square foot to Denver where I was able to buy at like kind of two fifty to three fifty a square foot it just made so much more gotcha. yeah the rents are lower than the Bay but but commensurate wise the yield is just much higher here um, you know just taking a step back Garrett like you know millennials are the biggest population in U.S. history bigger than the baby boomers right and you have kind of millennials hitting their peak earning years in the coming year, peak family formation earning years. So 25 million people are turning 30 in the next five years. Historically, when people turn 30, they have families, they move out of the apartments and the kind of dense urban cores to the suburbs and to houses. Sure. But we don't have enough supply to meet oh, no. the demand of these folks. And on top of that, private equity buying up so much of the housing supply. So you know, I, I just I think there's going to be a lot of demand for single family houses going forward. It's just, uh, you know, that's why I don't think there's going to see we're going to see some sort of huge crash in the single family, you know, in, in a residential. I'm not an economist. I don't have a crystal ball. Um, so I do think there's going to be a lot of opportunity, but it's just with interest rates this high. It doesn't it hasn't penciled for me right now. Yeah. Well, and, and Joshua, you know what people forget? Like, first of all, people are living longer too, right? They're healthier. They're making important lifestyle changes. So naturally, if you're going to live, you know, it used to be when we were growing up, I guess the average age of certain areas of the country probably were like 66 or 70 for lifespan. And now it's, I, again, I haven't really researched it to tell you exactly, but I know it's much, much higher. Um, you know, we have family that have, I have my grandmother's turning 96 and Jessica mm -hmm. had two grandfathers north of 90. Uh, as well. And you seem to know a lot of people in their 80s and 90s, right? So naturally, the longer people are going to live, 
uh, they're going to stay in their homes or, you know, some type of home, an apartment or whatever the facility may be. So we need to take care of them. And then you have your millennials, right, that are and, and they're going to form their households a little bit later. That, that's certainly true versus previous generations. You know, my parents, I remember, were married at like, I don't know, 22, 24. Right. right now, a lot of people are getting married at 28, 30, 32 or not getting married at all. That's your decision. OK, I'm not advocating anything. Um but uh, I, I'm, I'm very concerned about that. And, and, I, and I think people also forget that um, if the interest rates maintain this kind of peak level for the next, let's say, six months or year, no one's going to want to sell their house because what else, what are they going to go buy? Exactly. Right. Like even if your house went up in value significantly, right, for you to go sell it, now you're going to go buy something else at a much higher interest rate. You're giving up your 3% or 3.5% and taking on 5.5%, 6 whatever. So, at the, you know, essentially maybe, you know, your house may be smaller, but your payment's going to probably be the same. Right. So it's like no one's selling. I mean, it's just a very kind of slow, you know, um, kind of time there. Right. You seeing that too? A hundred percent. I mean, people ask me like, so we, my wife and I moved to Denver a couple of years ago and people are like, oh, are you here for the long term? And I'm like, I have a 2.65% 30 year mortgage. I am, I'm stuck here. Like I am never <laughs> leaving my house, you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> like, <laughs> I know. I thought three and I think I got three and a half on, on, on my, on my, on my house, which I thought was great, which is great. Right. Is great. And, and by the way, it's just so funny. Like if you go ask your, your uncles or your dad's grandfathers, whatever, they would tell you, well, we had 12% interest rates. We had 18% interest rates. Right. right? So right. like we were able to make a hell of a living with our family real uh, retail portfolio at five, five and a half, six percent. There's nothing wrong with paying interest rates. Like you can mm-hmm. run a country, you can run business at five, five and a half, six. A lot of people just are, you know, being exposed for the first time. Yeah. And that's really interesting when you go through a cycle when you're working with maybe a sponsor or a syndicator of a deal, they may never have been through a period where they had interest rates above three or four percent. And you know, it's easy to look good when interest rates are three and four percent. I mean, it's really, you know, you really everyone shines. It's important that you partner with a group that's had the adversity and gone through those, you know, whether it was 08 or, you know, recessions or, or 9-11 or whatever it may be, uh, or just high interest rates, you know. Um, I think that's a really so, important but, point, Garrett, because, you know, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Um, but, no, go ahead. But like, I think there's a lot of sponsors and developers who underwrote their projects, assuming a three and a half or four cap exit. And also assumed or refinancing at, you know, three and a half, four percent debt who, you know, I look, I, I saw this at Clean Fund. We were underwriting a lot of projects where there were very, very, very optimistic, you know, outcomes, which, which were justified in a like a zero percent interest rate environment. But there was no hedging for what's happening right now. And, and if you look at the, there's a trillion dollars of commercial real estate that's going to roll over in the next two years. Like, I, you know, I think we're going to see in certain sectors of the of, of real estate a bloodbath. I mean, office, I think I, I don't even know what's going to happen. Office, I think certain retail, not all retail, but like class B malls in the middle of nowhere. I, I'm not yeah. sure how they're going <laughs> to funny. I mean, you know, and I think there'll be amazing opportunities, too. But yeah, yeah you know, it's funny. You mentioned office, which I think is certainly objectively, I think a lot of people is number one on the, on the radar, you know, during COVID people thought retail would be, and, and really they were, they were wrong. People, you know, people want to be back together, want to be part of a community, want to feel connected, want to go outside and get a, get a pearly coffee, ice specialty coffee and gelato and sit outside, right. In a nice day. Um, but you know what people aren't talking about enough, Joshua, yeah. that the fall of office will be a boom for, I think, suburban retail, um, mm. because what's going to happen is as the country converts more to this three or four day office, you know, work week, whatever, formal work week or work from home or whatever you want, you can call it anything you want. Um, where are those people going to be, Doug? Right. Out and about. They're going to be out like they're either going to be like they're not really working. All, I'm sorry. In case you haven't realized <laughs> when, when you kind of hear this stuff, your, your employees are not just sitting home all day in front of the camera waiting for Zooms all day. They're going to go walk their dog. Mm-hmm. OK, they're going to go to the grocery store. They're going to go to Planet Fitness and they're going to go to Starbucks and take some calls there. And they're going to go support the local companies that are in the neighborhood shopping centers. I really believe that. So I would argue that as this shift happens and you hear more about the four day work week um, and you hear about office values going down and some of these buildings, Joshua, have to be scrapped like they're just based on the vintage 
They're not convertible. It's, it's just scrap it, start over. And that's okay. You know, that's part of life, right? That's part of uh, any, any country, any development. But I think it's going to really lift up local neighborhood shopping centers. Um, I have no fear of the stuff that we've invested in in terms of local neighborhood. I agree. Kind of regional stuff, especially not the best, like a class B mall. Um, that's a problem. You know, I, I think that's an issue. But those class B malls typically have, you know, a huge amount of parking. They're pretty well located. They're near highways, right? They're near potentially a hospital or a big university. So it's not that it has to totally go away. It has to change yeah. and kind of be enlightened by the community needs. So maybe that becomes, you know, a piece of it becomes 200 apartments. Another piece is a hotel because there's, you know, it's a Marriott Courtyard, Hilton Garden Inn because there's a big hospital up the street. Uh, then maybe there's a call center, you know, it's a hundred thousand square foot call center. And then maybe there's a great gym, you know, so it's not that they totally go away. It's that they change yeah. and they've got to be carved a little bit. And, you know, local municipalities need to be really forward thinking about getting ahead of this and meeting with developers. And that's why we love working with Greensboro. Well, they'll, they'll do these zoom calls that are kind of, um, you know, it's not like an official public meeting where, where you're voting on anything. It's just kind of like, Hey, let's flesh this out together. Let's make sure we're on the same page. Very helpful for developers before they spend way too much money and go down a road that's Im impossible. Mm -hmm. um, Joshua, a question for you on some of the green stuff that you've done. What yeah. are some recommendations you have for developers uh, to help save money, help save the environment, kind of combine that, that you know, being green and clean, but also with watching your bottom line and, and, and being good to, to the de developer through some of those programs you've talked about? So when I was at Clean Fund, I was managing director of Clean Fund, and we were um, a specialty finance company providing capital to developers and sponsors using this financing mechanism called PACE. And PACE stands for Property Assessed Clean Energy. It's a way to finance building improvements that get repaid from property taxes. But you can only use it for things that improve um, the carbon footprint of the building, whether it's through energy or water. Now, I would say the vast majority of my clients were conservative who didn't believe in climate change, right? Uh -huh. well, what they did sure. believe in is their bottom line. And right. so and the, the reality is, is energy efficiency. And what I mean by that is HVAC, uh, you know, envelope systems, lighting, and then it, it gets harder. Certain things get harder to get improved. You know, it can be at a high upfront cost and uh, less of a return, but you know, lighting is the low hanging fruit, building controls, things of that nature, HVAC. And, and, and it pays itself back much faster than other, you know, you might be in a rent controlled area where you can, that's a kind of a bad example, but oftentimes energy efficiency is one of the most, um, you know, quickest paybacks, but people don't do it because of the upfront costs. And that's why these kind of third party financing mechanisms like PACE are a great solution, but it begins, you know, we, we can't track, we can't change anything that we don't measure. So doing, you know, um, just kind of like getting into building management systems that track how much energy are you consuming? When are you wasting? When is your building, you know, why are your lights on in the middle of the night in, in your sure. basement and things of that nature that people aren't even aware of, you know, I would think, I would think like something like, like parking lot lighting would be would be really easy to track and and then quickly you see that you'd see the bill right when the bill comes now with the new leds you know you you may not believe in climate change dougie but you certainly believe in profit change mm -hmm. and um i remember i think it was duke energy in north carolina did a program where they approached us and they said look um we will pay for these leds uh or or we will finance it for you there was some type of special program like you said joshua and you know it was a big upfront number right i mean bigger than we thought but there was some type of assistance where either we got to pay for it over five years or some you know longer amortization that you typically wouldn't have with something like that, uh, or or they paid for a portion. I I don't remember all the details, but it made all the sense in the world to, to do that. Um, and so I think I agree. Lighting is a low hanging fruit. We also had um, one of our loans with Hilltop House Apartments, which we sold last year. We had this Fannie Mae Green program where we had to go in and. Um, you know, do, do something to like the shower heads and the faucets. We had to upgrade some of them for lower water usage. Um, uh, probably a couple lighting changes. And I think we had to put away like $130,000 at closing, uh, to, to do, to do this program turned out we were able to actually do it for much less. I think we ended up saving around $30,000 
which was a pure you know profit back to back to the investors uh, because it didn't cost as much as the bank thought it was going to cost. So we were happy to do that. And in, in exchange, Joshua, they gave us a better interest rate. Mm, you know? Great. I mean, so it's like, yeah, I mean, you you didn't think you were green, but if you got a better interest rate, of course you yeah. are now. And then Garrett, <laughs> then you you're bringing down the operating expenses, of the building, so therefore the NOI right. is going up, and you multiply the value that goes up. Rate, of course, just your value goes the up. Value of it without caring about whether climate change common is sense right. right you don't have to care about climate change to make a difference like exactly. you know it's important to, to 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 you know do the right thing and uh but if you don't understand something you certainly will understand saving money on the expense side so anyway let's transition a little bit more into what i wanted to really jump in and have you on the show there's been so much talk joshua about the future of real estate investing and I know something that you call the democratization, democratization of real estate investing and opening up investing uh, more, more fair to, to more people who could afford it. Um, let's talk a little bit about that. You know, Doug, we've had different people on the show mm -hmm. and we've talked a lot about that real estate investing historically has been for kind of the old kind of kind of the old white guys country club. Right. It's not really been open. Just being honest, just not kind of been open to a lot of different people of color and people from all different demographics and all over the country. And there's a lot of companies out there in this kind of prop tech and fintech space that are looking to do this. We, we did have a company on the show, Lex Markets, before mm -hmm. who was trading shares online. They've since actually shut down. So this is hard to wow. do. Not easy to do. Um, so I want Joshua to talk a little bit about what he's doing at Bonfire and his passion and uh, what he feels. So Joshua, take the floor. Tell us a little bit about the program. Yeah. So, so Bonfire was born out of conversations I had with my friends who are in their 30s and 40s, who work hard, have good jobs, um, but many of them, you know, are still saddled with student debt and they want to own real estate. You know, many of us are told, you know, we'll grow up, we'll go to college, we'll get married, we'll, we'll have kids, we'll, we'll own a house by 30 or whatever. And for most, for most people, you know, the biggest source of wealth is the house that they own, right? Because of the law of compound interest, or a co compound, you know, basically leveraging your equity on a compound basis over a number of years, and you know, um, unfortunately, um, that sort of American dream is 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 becoming out of reach for a lot of people, and there's a myriad of reasons why interest rates have doubled, student debt, you know, private equity buying up a lot of the supply. I mean, you know, we, there's not enough supply that's been built in the last 20 years. Right. There's, there's a lot of reasons why this is is like that. And Bonfire was really born out of these conversations and, and wanted to create a way for anyone, whether they're accredited, unaccredited, U.S., international, to be able to directly own real estate and own it as easy as it is to, to own a stock. And that's basically what we've done. Um, you know, we, we use blockchain. We're not, we're not a crypto company. We have no, we, we think a lot of crypto is BS and, and just full of scams. But we think that blockchain as an enabling technology is the key to unlocking this. I can geek out on the specifics of that. But from a very high level, that's kind of what Bonfire is all about. Awesome. So tell us about how does somebody get involved with Bonfire? What's, what do they do? Do you post a property? for sale on your website and they can then go buy tokens and, and read all about it. Just kind of take us through that. Absolutely. So, yeah, so we're still, you know, doing, we're doing our, our beta right now where we're putting uh, properties on our platform one at a time. And like we just sold out a, an allocation to a $60 million hotel actually last week. And how it works is we'll connect with a sponsor. They'll have a deal. We'll vet them. We'll vet the deal. And then we'll put it on our platform Basically, and how that works is we'll have the information about the, you know, the specifics of the business plan and photos and all that stuff. And people can buy tokens that represent an LP interest in the deal. And the advantage of that, like this hotel project um, usually would have, I know the sponsor very well, there's usually a minimum of $100,000 buy-in. Um, right, right. Because of our syndication and our platform, we were able to make that two thousand dollars. Now, two thousand dollars is still a lot of money for for people, and and not everyone's going to be able to, you know, put two thousand dollars down for a token. But it's still, it's not a hundred thousand, right? And right. So, totally, no, totally different world that you're talking to at that juncture. Yeah, exactly. Um, and and even you know, we had a lot of accredited investors come in, and people put it. You know, we had several people two people put in 50,000 and several over 25,000. So there's still like big boys who are entering you know, our platform right. and, and even wealthy people might not have access to deal flow that billionaires have access to. Right. So oh, yeah. our whole thing of bonfires, anyone can come together 
and have access to these deals. <laughs> um, so I, I think that's that, that's a great idea. Now, is are are you doing the deals yourself, or are you only partnering with, like, for example, I'm a syndicator, I'm a sponsor, right? So I say, okay, I'm out in the market now. I'm raising five million dollars for a multifamily project in Greensboro, North Carolina, right? So I show it to you. You love it. You bless it. You're looking. Your your, your team looks through the underwriting and understanding the asset. And now you said, hey, I want to put it on the Bonfire platform. Um, are you exclusively going to be raising the five million for me, or or are you kind of taking a piece of it and you're and maybe you'll raise a million dollars in in your tokens? Um, talk talk a, a little bit about that. For now, we're only going to be raising a portion of it um, because there's something to be said about scarcity and just enabling, you know, um, for, for us, like our community kind of first come first serve. And, you know, maybe we only have to take 500,000 of it. And also as we're building out our community and really understanding what are the types of assets people want to see, is it hospitality is it industrial? What, what does that look like? Um, I think it's better to kind of, you know, under promise over deliver to our sponsor friends and partners than, than vice versa. Mm -hmm. So we would probably be just taking a, a portion of that at this point. Gotcha. And so what's the advantage for somebody who wants to invest, you know, 50 K yeah. uh, typically they would buy a LP share through me, right. As a syndicator. And they're a part of, of our program, you know, at Bedrin. what's the advantage or the changes now when they go to a token uh, talk a little bit about, about that. Yeah. So first of all, Garrett, from your perspective, there's no difference. We're not charging you anything as a sponsor. Sure. To, yeah. Okay. That's right. Um, we're not a broker dealer. We're not a placement agent. The advantage of why someone would want to come through Bonfire instead of going directly through you is tokenization. Is um, our, our tokenization? We're building a secondary marketplace where people can buy and sell their tokens. So, an example: Let's say your Greensboro, North Carolina project for whatever reason, there's you know uh, construction costs jump and and debt increases you know there's some sort of like default in the u.s government and interest rates double and i don't know some sort of reason why the project takes longer to season than what you right. anticipated right sure and so happens. people think happens all the time right they people think they're in for three or four years and it turns out to be year five and someone gets divorced or their kid is going to college they need the capital they're stranded in sure. this deal they want the money back right they want the money back right well we're creating really the world's first liquid marketplace for real estate where people who have interest in LP deals can get out of them, you know, and we'll have a marketplace so that they can, if they want to exit, they can get out sooner than the seasoning of the project. So, so that's, that's the real special sauce that you now have this new marketplace, uh, kind of a secondary market, like a stub hub. If you're into tickets, Dougie, right? Yeah. You know, you bought tickets to the giant game. You forgot it was Samantha's first Christmas. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> I gotta, I gotta get rid of my tickets before my wife kills me. True. And uh, what do you do? You, you, you can't call the Giants. They're like, we sold them. Sorry, we're done. Yeah. Right. Um. You go to StubHub. It's a secondary market, right? Mm -hmm. So basically, Joshua is trying to uh, build the the secondary market for commercial real estate, where someone could just sell that token. You could sell it to Pat. You could sell it to, you know, Brian, whoever wants to buy the token. Um. And 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 that's more difficult to do in a typical LP. There, there's not, it, it, you know. The regular syndication that I put out, it's technically illiquid, right? So you may say, "Hey, I need I need the money back for Samantha's wedding," and I may say, "Well, sorry, like I, I don't. There's no one that's going to buy it from you right now. I don't know anyone that wants to spend a hundred grand." Mm -hmm. um, but here, Joshua, I would guess your thought is to build your platform so big that there'll be, you know, millions of people or whatever, hundreds of thousands of people that are actively looking on the platform and could bid on the token or just want to buy the token, and then the transaction using blockchain technology makes it, you know, immediate, safe, quick, right? Everything's stored there. And, um, and then would the developer, um, have certain parameters? Like, are, are they, would they say, well, you know, we only want the, the token sold for, you know, a, a gain, not a loss, or are there any certain rights that come with it or not? Or help me understand that a little bit better. Well, I think, so the, the, the token holders have a, you know, para pursue interest in the deal relative to any other LP interests. The the biggest obstacle and, and the reason why we're only taking allocations right now, we're not trying to do entire deals is lenders might have covenants that say, well, if 51% of the the equity is were to change, 
that's a violation of the covenant because we're underwriting. Yes, we're underwriting the asset. But we're also underwriting the, right. the the equity owner. But if we're ten or twenty five percent of the asset, the lenders tend to not care. Right, small amount. Right, that's a good point. You got to keep it right. smaller. Right, totally makes sense. So, how'd you come up with the name Bonfire? Because when I hear Bonfire, it makes me think of our Samoset days, our mm -hmm. our our camp days. I know some of our camp friends are chiming in in the comment section. I see Jay Meadow uh, asking some funny questions about. Uh, what it's like being the mayor of camp uh, that that may have been, uh, you know, thrown. I don't know if that was a, a real deal or not. <laughs> I definitely won mayor one year. But um, how'd you come up with Bonfire? Was, was it from thinking of all those fun uh, camp nights together? So I wish I could say it was that. Um, and maybe unconsciously it was. Um, but basically, <laughs> I, I someone forwarded me this naming guide, this company called Igor uh, Naming Company. And they have this this PDF of like, and they were talking about like, what are the attributes of good names? So give me an example. Right. Slack, right? Is counterintuitive right. for a productivity B2B right. software, right? right. Um, Makes no sense. You know, Apple for computers. Like, you know, if you look at what the computer names were back in the day, like International Business, IBM and Gateway and Hewlett Packard, they're very descriptive. Then Apple comes along. What does Apple <laughs> come with? Um, you know, the Garden of Eden, like, um, you know, Newton's Apple, all these various things that are not attributed normally to computer companies. And I was looking at everything in the real estate space, Zillow, all these made up names, Zillow, Redfin, right, really don't right. a lot, or they're very descriptive, realtor.com, right? And I was like, how can we create something that's emotive and just really stands out and has its own meaning that also implies people coming together. And, you know, the name Bonfire came up and, I, and we, we jumped on it. Yeah, I like it. No, I mean, it comes, you know, when a fire starts and the bond, it just keeps building and building. And it's a big group of community. You keep throwing more wood in there and it's bigger and bigger and bigger. Right. I get it. I get it. Um, but actually, on a, on a serious note, let, let's talk about camp for a second, because, you okay. know, I'm curious how, how you see your experience. Um, going to camp and what that's like being an investor and an entrepreneur. I will tell you from my personal experience, I think going to camp was uh, a foundation for me that gave me a tremendous amount of confidence to go to college, to mm -hmm. move to California with, with by myself pretty much, right? To mm -hmm. go live in New York City. Um, I feel like that was such an underlying foundation where I felt like at camp, we built our own little niche, our little family, our little you know mm -hmm. bunk, and we stayed together for so many years. And I feel like that was really important to me in terms of confidence and strength uh, moving forward in, into business. I'm just curious your 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 thoughts as well. Yeah, I really I really resonate and echo what you just shared. For, for me, you know, I was the only kid. So I, I joined. I came in 1989. I was the first. I was the only kid at Samoset from the West Coast. So not only wow. anyone from California, there was no one in the West Coast. I came in wearing Stussy, right? Everyone oh my God. You taught me all about it. Tell me all about it. <laughs> And everyone was like, you know, East Coast kind of preppy. And I wasn't like right. an especially good athlete. And like we had people like Tatelman and Kinnerman in our bunk who were like Incredible. amazing athletes and Greg Royce and just a whole bunch of folks who were, you know, really good athletes. And I was, a, I felt like a fish out of water, man. I mean, the first years were, I, I, I don't even, I remember not really liking the first year and just, <laughs> you know, I was like kind of beat up a little bit. And, but, you know, there's something about, and I think my parents kind of forced me to go back a year later. And it's like, there's something about you learn, I learned resilience, you know, yep. which as an entrepreneur is probably one of the most important characteristics other than kind of integrity and a whole bunch of other things. But like resilience, getting out of my comfort zone, having to just make lemon, you know, lemonades out of lemons or le lemonade out of, yeah, turn lemons yeah, yeah. into lemonade. Turn lemons into lemonade, yeah. And, you know, learn about long-term relationships and 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 what it, and, and keeping in touch with people and, and just, you know, being not, being a selfish douche, you know, excuse my language. <laughs> I don't know where to, Are you allowed to say that on YouTube? I don't know. Yeah, 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 we're good. All right, we're just, but yes, no, I mean, it was, it was a really, it's a, for me, I ended up going to college in Connecticut. I went to my junior year abroad in Nepal. I went to graduate school in London. Like it, I've tried right. backpacked solo through sub saharan Africa, through India. Like I've started, you know, entrepreneur, like I think camp going there at age 10 was a foundation for taking a leap and jumping into the pool and knowing that it's all going to be okay. Yeah, man. I, I, I think it's awesome. And I, I think you're, you're hundred percent correct. I, I feel the same way. And, and also to add the concept of like, you know, teamwork, right? Like you've got this bunk, you've got your counselors who are kind of like the quasi parents. Um, and you've got these other cousins that are around the other leaders of the bunks and, you know, you're in this little family unit where you got to really support each other, um, and, and kind of help each other out. Um, 
you're away from your parents. So you're really focused on that. But also I love the idea of like the, the openness and support of trying new things and not being able, you know, not being afraid to fail. So with, with, with camp, you know, you had, you had some structure in terms of your, your activities, but they also every day had this thing called scrum, right? Where you'd go sit at these picnic tables and be like, what do you want to try today? You want to try basketball? You want to try softball? You want to try lacrosse? You want to try arts and crafts, uh, riflery, um, which you probably can't even do today. Uh, zip line, right? And you were constantly fed the opportunity of, I want to try something. And I just think it's so important as an entrepreneur to be open to trying new things and not being afraid of failure. Cause there's a lot you can learn from figuring out what you don't like in life in addition to what you do like. And like I always say, when you find something you like, you know, go all in it, go all in on it. And, and that's important uh, at a young age, I think, to learn that um, it's okay to one day try an activity and say, you know what, I'm, I don't like it. Or another day, I could like it if I had a little more training on it, or I had a little more support on it, or we did it a little bit differently. So um, I'm, I'm all for it. I know you love Maine. I mean, I think your family had a home there at, at some point. We go up to Kenny Bunkport, Maine every summer. And I always think about Sam Asset. And I remember the years traveling, going to, you know, bar mitzvahs and stuff and get togethers and now having Facebook, being able to LinkedIn re reconnect, I think is great. Um, so I'm a big believer. My kids are going to go to camp. And uh, mm -hmm. I just think if, if you, if you can afford it and have the opportunity or can get a grant or whatever it is, or any type of program, even if it's like a week, that independence that you can uh, kind of gain from being away from your mom and dad, I think will last you uh, a long time. I love it, man. I completely resonate with that. And I love what you just shared around. And I hadn't thought about it, sort of the courage, like the, the willingness to try new things and having it be okay to not be good at it. You know, um, for me, I had never played lacrosse until I came to Samoset, right? And yeah. I was never good at lacrosse, but it's fun. And I really try to like, and with my team, you know, like one of our values at Bonfire is like excellence, but not perfection, because excellence means the best of our own ability, but perfection invites neuroses. Right. Um, right. If, we, if we want to be perfect, we're going to be if we have a culture around that, people are going to be on pins and needles or eggshells and no one's going to take chances. Right. Um, and that willingness to fail is is a really important character, uh, you know, attribute of an entrepreneur or just a parent or whatever in life. And I didn't realize until now that that was actually something that was kind of encouraged. Sam said. So thank you for that reminder. Yeah. Awesome, man. All right. Cool. So we're going to wrap up. Um, we're going to put you in the lightning round. If you're up for that, just a short kind of light uh, few okay. questions that we ask all our guests. Do we have the music ready, Pat? Yeah. Right. And I'm going to add a couple extra special ones for you. Okay. Cool. You tell me when you're ready, Pat. Right. Let's go. Let's do it. All right, Joshua, what's a business book you'd recommend to an up and coming entrepreneur? Power versus force. It's not a business book, but it's. That's fine. Good. No, no. It could be a regular book. Okay. Um, Mattapanai or Vega? <laughs> <laughs> oh my god both uh, <laughs> um if we were to go to outer space together because i know that's one travel destination you haven't gone to yet who's taking us elon bezos or your old friend richard branson from that clean fun story realistically elon he'll be yeah. quicker i think i think so i think so but branson would be more fun probably that's be more fun um, yeah uh first concert best concert uh, first concert, U2 in LA. Um, oh, wow. Best concert, Radiohead in London. Wow. That's a great first concert, U2. Um, what was your favorite favorite food at the A&G? Pizza. Come on. Oh, for sure. That, that's really the only thing I guess you could get there, right? I don't remember they had anything. Maybe some hoagies. That's, I remember pizza. I remember like getting, I think I remember eating a pint of chocolate chip cookie dough ice cream from Ben and yep. Jerry's. I feel like we went to camp during the cookie dough explosion. Oh yeah. oh, yeah. Um, all right, man. That's all I got for you. That's good enough. Let's go wrap it up. <laughs> awesome. So if anybody wants to connect with you, Joshua, talk a little bit about real estate investing, about travel, the world, um, about tokens, what would be the best way? Would you want them to reach out to you on LinkedIn, on the Twitter? I mean, you can email me Joshua at bonfire.capital or LinkedIn, there's the handle right there. Uh, or, or, or Twitter, LinkedIn. I'm I'm very accessible and available. So awesome. Easy to find. I appreciate it. And if you reach out to Joshua, let him know you watched the Get Up a Garrett show, so he knows that we're old friends and can uh, can chat with you. And, and this was great. It's great to uh, to spend time together and reconnect. Thanks, and man. you Me know, too. would love to do more together with the old Samoset crew. Now it's easier with social media. So we got to get a real reunion put together somewhere on That's the East great. Coast. 
Let's do it. You know, we got We got to get a, a real, a real formal reunion where, where we spend a weekend together or something. Everyone It'd be a lot of fun. I would love that. So, Thank you, Gary, for having me. This was a, this was a pleasure. Thank you. You're welcome. So guys, make sure to um, give us a thumbs up, write a comment, write a review. All that helps the algorithms, right? All that Dougie stuff he tells me to. <laughs> and, um, you know, keep watching the show, share, like what you see. Let us know if you want to hear about more, uh, more content. We're, we're happy to try to feature guests that fit in that. And uh, just remember, the more you give, the more you get. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks, everyone.